happy to welcome you to the uh, this lecture in the Poses Lectureship Series in honor of uh, Lewis and Shale Poses. The lecture is put on by the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies, and I am Ed Wright, director of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. Joining us as co-sponsors in this presentation, uh, in addition to the Poses families who support this uh, every year, I want to thank also the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and our Dean J.P. Jones uh, at the University of Arizona, also the Jewish Federation of Southern Arizona, the Jewish Community Foundation of Southern Arizona, the Tucson Jewish Community Center, and the Marriott University Park Hotel in Tucson. This lecture uh, is one in an ongoing series, and today we have a special guest. Our, after the presentation, there will be an opportunity to have your questions uh, responded to by our lecturer. Uh, so if you would please enter any questions that come up into the chat or the Q&A session, section of your uh, Zoom site, I will have those before me and I'll present them to uh, our lecturer, who is um, uh, not just a guest, but one of us. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Asher Susser, Professor of Middle East History at Tel Aviv University, who has served as the director of the university's highly acclaimed Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies, where he remains a senior research fellow. He has been a Fulbright Fellow, a visiting professor at Cornell, the University of Chicago, Brandeis University, and well as a visiting, fe visiting fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He was the only Israeli academic invited to join Prime Minister Rabin in Washington, D.C. to meet with King Hussein to, walk, to sign the Washington Accord. In 2006, he was selected as Tel Aviv University's Faculty of Humanities Outstanding Lecturer. And in 2012, he was included in the provost list of the university's 100 outstanding senior faculty. In the past few years, he's taken on another role. He's become a popular online instructor for Coursera, Coursera, where he has taught over 115,000 students in over 160 countries. In short, through his research, teaching, and political advising, he has had a profound international impact. I am very pleased also to say that Dr. Susser has served as a visiting professor of modern Israel studies uh, in the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Arizona for several years. And we're delighted to have him join us in this venue today. An internationally acclaimed scholar, Susser is the author or editor of scores, scores of scholarly articles, incisive opinion pieces, and many important books on Israeli and Middle Eastern history and politics. Perhaps his two most important books as they relate to our topic today are Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, the two-state imperative as well as the rise of Hamas in Palestine and the crisis of secularism in the ancient world. He is in demand as a speaker around the world and we're very fortunate to have him in this venue today. The title of his presentation is Israel, Hamas and the Palestinian Issue. Where do we go from here? Professor Susser, dear friend Asher, we look forward to learning about Israel, Hamas and the Palestinian Issue. I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you and to give uh, the poses uh, talk this year. Um, so I thank you very much for your uh, kind invitation. And I thank all those who are uh, joining us. So uh, good morning to you all uh, from Israel uh, this evening as it is here. Uh, speaking about uh, Israel, Hamas, and the Palestinians, um, I would like to start by uh, putting this in its uh, historical context in order to understand how it is that we got to where we are and to take it from there to where uh, this may be going. We are engaged, we Israel that is, engaged in three circles of conflict. Israel and the Arabs, Israel and the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, 
and Jews and Palestinian Arabs in Israel itself, which in recent weeks has actually come to the fore. If we look at the first circle, Israel and the Arabs, essentially the Arab-Israeli conflict, the conflict between Israel and the Arab states has been over since we made peace with Egypt. The Arab states cannot make war with Israel without the participation of Egypt. So since the peace with Egypt in the 1970s, we can say that the Arab-Israeli conflict has essentially uh, been over. We have not fought a war with an Arab state uh, since 1973, that is uh, 48 years. We have fought some wars in Lebanon, but they were against the PLO or against Hamas, or against Hezbollah, uh, not against uh, the state of Lebanon. Most recently, Israel has normalized relations with uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, and Sudan. Uh, but I would not hesitate to say that these agreements, as important as they may be, I think were oversold, overrated, and overstated because these were countries that Israel has never fought against. And the agreements were posited as if uh, the Palestinians who are at the heart of it all could actually be ignored. And that was never true. The second circle, Israel and the Palestinians. And one may ask, why is the conflict over with the Arab states and not with the Palestinians? They are ostensibly much weaker than the Arab states. The Palestinians are perhaps the weakest of all players. But they are here right next door. And there is nothing that we can do about that. Uh, the reason why we haven't made peace with them while well, we have made with some very important Arab states like uh, Egypt and Jordan, and we were even nearly there with Syria in the 1990s. Between Israel and the Arab states, there is one set of issues to be resolved. That is, how does Israel return the territories it occupied in 1967 in exchange for peace agreements? We did it with Egypt, we did it with Jordan, and as I say, we nearly did it with Syria. But with the Palestinians, there are two sets of issues. The 1967 file, as I call it, which is about the West Bank and Gaza and uh, East Jerusalem. But with the Palestinians, there is a file that doesn't exist with the Arab states. And that is the 1948 file. The file that is about Israel's creation not Israel's expansion in 1967. Israel cannot renegotiate its creation. Israel can talk about 1967. Israel can talk about returning territories it took in 1967, but Israel cannot negotiate its establishment. And the 1948 file has two items. Both of them challenge Israel's right to exist as the nation state of the Jewish people. The first issue is the right of Palestinian refugees to return. That is to return to Israel proper and erode its nature as the nation state of the Jewish people. And the other is what is to be the place of the Palestinian Arab minority in Israel, 20% of the population who are not Jewish in a state that defines itself as the nation state of the Jewish people. So these two issues, the right of return of the 1948 refugees and the place of the Arab minority in Israel are issues that challenge not Israel's expansion in 1967, but its very being. We have our narrative about 1948 and the Palestinians have theirs. These narratives are so far apart that presently I would say, and for the foreseeable future, they are unbridgeable. For us, Israel is the epitome 
of historical justice. Israel is this grand act of historical self-defense, the self-defense of the Jewish people against their horrific fate in the diaspora. We say, from the Holocaust to resurrection. That is the nutshell of the Israeli national narrative. But for the Palestinians, Israel is not the epitome of historical justice, but quite the reverse. It is the epitome of injustice and dispossession. Israel is not about self-defense, they would argue. It's all about aggression. What makes a Palestinian a Palestinian after all? Ethnically, Palestinians are Arabs, like other speakers of the Arabic language in Jordan or Syria and elsewhere. Most of them Sunni Muslims, just like Jordanians and Syrians and uh, Egyptians. But Palestinians have a singular, unique historical memory. It is the historical memory of the defeat of 1948. That which they call the Nakba, the disaster. And it is those who identify with this Palestinian defeat who are the Palestinian people. That is what defines them. That is what defines them as different from other Arabs. Palestinians are Palestinians by virtue of their identification with the historical memory of 1948. It makes it virtually impossible to achieve a final agreement with Israel by a people whose very self-identity emanates from its opposition to Israel's creation. There is a gulf of mistrust between Israelis and Palestinians that has never been bridged. And no final agreement has been achieved with them. And probably no final agreement will be achieved with them anytime soon. But in the meantime, there are the realities on the ground. In all of Eretz Israel, British Mandatory Palestine, there are six and a half million Palestinians and six and a half million Jews. The numbers are more or less equal, give or take a few. The Zionist endeavor had many assumptions. Some were correct and others proved to be untrue. One of these assumptions that didn't materialize was that given the opportunity, the great majority of the Jews leaving Europe would come to Eretz Israel, but they didn't. They went elsewhere, Western Europe and North America, as you all know only too well. The other assumption that didn't materialize was that the Arabs eventually will acquiesce. As much as they are opposed to the Zionist endeavor, they will acquiesce because of the good that we will bring. We will bring them European style modernity, their standards of living will rise, and in the long run, they will appreciate what Zionism will do for them. But the Arabs did not acquiesce. And therefore, the Jews not only never obtained a majority in Palestine, but never maintained peace either. And therefore, the Zionists had to accept the idea of partition. There simply weren't enough of them to have the land in its entirety. So they had to accept partition. But because of Arab hostility 
Partition never meant peace. Actually, partition meant the introduction to war. And that is how 1948 came about as a result of the 1947 UN partition. Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, not because the Israelis believed that peace would follow. Israel withdrew from Gaza in order to preserve the Jewish majority. There are 2 million Palestinians living in Gaza and therefore Arik Sharon's decision to unilaterally withdraw from Gaza was not about peacemaking. It was about keeping Israel Jewish. But the rockets from Gaza that have come as a consequence in ever increasing numbers as time goes by and the rockets get better and uh, with longer ranges and more lethal warheads, the rockets from Gaza have become an ever increasing threat. Israel had a military doctrine which worked for years and years. Never to fight Israel's wars at home. That is to transfer the battlefield to the enemy. Israel is small, densely populated and vulnerable. So the war must be transferred to the enemy's territory as soon as it begins and Israel should even preempt if need be. And all Israel's wars were fought in that fashion. Until 1967, the great victory of the Six Day War. But even since then, Israel was never really drawn into a war that exposed the home front to the enemy's aggressive capabilities. This element of Israeli military doctrine has been seriously eroded by Hamas and by Hezbollah. By firing from areas protected by civilians and targeting Israeli civilians, Hamas has managed to bring the war to Israel's home front. And Israel is therefore exposed and the home front is exposed more than ever before since 1948. Having withdrawn from Gaza and the results that it brought, Israel has no appetite to do the same in the West Bank. And you will all recall when the Oslo process failed and the suicide bombers came from the West Bank into Israel's cities, they caused far more deaths than the rockets. So Israel has no great appetite, as I say, or intention to do the same in the West Bank as it did in Gaza, but the status quo has consequences too. By hanging on to the West Bank, the border that once existed between Israel and Jordan, between Israel and the West Bank, the 1967 boundary, that is the boundary that was created by the war in 1948 and lasted until the War of 1967, the erasure of the 1967 boundary has led to the merger of the Palestinians on both sides of the line. The Palestinians in the West Bank and the Palestinians in Israel see themselves as one and the same people in a one state reality. And this brings me to a discussion of the ever important place of the Arabs in Israel. In Israel, what is their place in the Israeli state that defines itself as the nation state of the Jewish people? And amongst the Arab minority in Israel, there are contradictory, contradictory political trends in recent years. On the one hand, there is an increasing desire to share and integrate into Israel as equals. Anyone visiting Israel these days won't be able to go into a supermarket, a pharmacy, or a hospital for that matter, and not encounter Israeli Arabs working together with Israeli Jews at all levels. Rising levels of education are leading to ever increasing participation of the Arabs of Israel in Israel's workforce. 
if you observe the manner in which Israel fought against the COVID-19 pandemic, 20% of Israel's medical staff, from professors down to the orderlies, are Arabs. And it is they who side by side with their Jewish colleagues in the hospitals of Israel fought against the COVID-19 pandemic. They were in the trenches, they were in the front line. And today, political parties of the right and the center left speak of forming coalitions with Arab parties, unheard of beforehand. And we now have a new government in Israel that replaced the Netanyahu government, as you know, in which an Arab party is a member of the coalition. So there is this increasing integration of the Arabs uh, in Israel into Israeli society at all levels in all fora. But at the same time, simultaneously with this process of integration, there is an increasing nationalist alienation from the Jewish state and identification as Palestinians. There is a very common saying amongst Arabs in Israel, your independence day is our day of disaster. Yom istiklalikum, yom nakbatina, as they say. Your independence is our catastrophe. A new nation state law was passed in Israel in 2018, which reasserted Israel's nature as the nation state of the Jewish people. But it did not include a passage about equality for all. And the law therefore was not well received by Israel's Arab minority. And there are some on the radical Israeli right, like one former minister and present day also member of uh, Knesset, member of parliament, who in April this year, in voicing his hostility towards the Arab minority in Israel, said that the Arabs in Israel are citizens of Israel for the meantime, he said. They have members in parliament for the meantime, he added, just imagine if a senator or congressman in the US would have said something like that about Jews being citizens of the United States for the meantime, at least. In Israel's mixed cities, cities where there are many Arabs and Jews living together like Jaffa, Lod, Acre, and of course, Jerusalem, there are property issues. There are institutions created by young uh, religious Jews, they called Torah youth institutions, where uh, you have situations of tension, if not to say even conflict. That is not about real estate, but is essentially part of the nationalist struggle about the future of the country. This is the story of Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem, that residential area in East Jerusalem where Jews had properties before 1948. And these uh, movements of uh, the political right sought to retrieve these Jewish properties uh, from before 1948 and to evict the Palestinians who were living them in them since 1948. And this was portrayed as a real estate matter, but it isn't. It's much more complex than that. It's all understandable for Jews to wish to retrieve property that they once owned before 1948, but Arabs are barred from doing that. And there is as much, if not much more, Arab property in Israel of today from before 1948, which Arabs cannot retrieve. 
So the tension rose over these property issues in the mixed cities and especially in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem. And the Arabs in Israel and in the West Bank and Gaza began to say, we will not allow a second Nakba, that is a reenactment of Arab dispossession of 1948. And thus appeared the clashes on Temple Mount during the month of Ramadan in May and riot police entering the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Palestinians stoning Jews at the Kotel just below Temple Mount. And then as a move in domestic Palestinian politics, Hamas trying to upstage the PLO served an ultimatum to Israel that if Israel did not cease its actions in Jerusalem, Hamas would fire rockets to Jerusalem. And this had a lot to do with the Palestinian decision that came just before by uh, President Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, canceling elections to the legislative authority of the, Pal of the Palestinian Authority, canceling the elections to the Palestinian parliament. The elections were canceled because uh, Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen feared that if elections were actually held, Hamas would win them. Canceling the elections therefore gave Hamas the opportunity to try and assert their political influence and thus issuing the ultimatum to Israel as an act of uh, stepping up and reasserting their standing within Palestinian society. Well, Israel, of course, rejected the ultimatum. There's no way in which Israel would accept an ultimatum from Hamas. And thus the rockets flew to Jerusalem. And from there came Israel's response and 11 days of warfare. So where do we go from here? Is it over? Was that round of 11 days of warfare the end of it? I don't think anyone here really believes that. And not only that, we had a, a mini repeat performance just last week when incendiary balloons were sent by Hamas over into Israel, burning fields of our farmers near Gaza, which eventually resulted in a very severe Israeli retaliation, which has restored the quiet. And Israel is now establishing new rules of engagement with Hamas, where the new government in Israel is saying very clearly, Israel will respond fiercely to any and every single provocation, whether it is incendiary balloons or rockets or whatever it may be. So the tension is still very high. And even though <clears throat> the quiet is being maintained for the short term, the question is, what about the long term? Where do we go from here? What do we want to do with Gaza? What is Gaza? How do we understand what Gaza is? Is Gaza six brigades of Hamas? Is Hamas a launching pad for rockets against Israel? Or is Hamas two million people? How come Israel has had 15 years of quiet since 2006 with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah is much stronger than Hamas. Hezbollah has far more rockets than Hamas and much better rockets than Hamas. High precision and with warheads that are very destructive. Yet Israel and Hezbollah haven't fought each other for 15 years. How come? How come we have these constant recurrences of warfare with Hamas, but not with Hezbollah. Between Israel and Hamas, there is a mutual deterrence. They have a lot to lose, and so do we. If there were to be a war with Hezbollah, and precision rockets of high caliber would be fired into Israel, 
Israel would have to launch a large ground operation very soon. It would not be able to let things pass for 10 or 11 days and allow Israeli targets to be hit with such precision. A large ground operation would cause very heavy casualties in Lebanon and heavy casualties to Israeli forces as well. But this would be highly destructive. Lebanon is a state with state-like infrastructure, airports, seaports, highways, bridges, power stations. All of these would be hit by Israel. The damage that Israel would cause to Lebanon would be huge. Lebanon and Hezbollah have a lot to lose. Gaza, however, has nothing to lose. They're living on the verge of a humanitarian disaster. It is true, they have made some very bad choices. They have turned Gaza into a launching pad for rockets when they could have turned Gaza into a version of Singapore. But it is in our own interest that they have a life and a lot to lose. Their sewage is our problem. Their COVID pandemic is our problem. So there is an Israeli plan, which has been worked out for years, but never implemented in the Israeli defense establishment, to build in Gaza a power station, a desalination plant, a sewage treatment plant, a port, to allow people from Gaza to work in Israel, to create a functioning economy in Gaza, making Gaza into a place that is worth living in. To go through this reconstruction of Gaza and development uh, is a long shot. Hamas may very well be willing to continue to sacrifice in Gaza for the sake of its political and ideological goals, rather than to engage in this kind of reconstruction, which would require concessions to Israel. But it's not only Hamas. Israel must resume talks with the Palestinian Authority that the previous government, the Netanyahu government, tended to ignore. Not being interested in a two-state solution, the previous government in Israel preferred to have Hamas in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank disconnected, dealing with Hamas in Gaza through politics and military and leaving the Palestinian Authority essentially passively by the wayside. But they are not going to disappear. And speaking to the Palestinian Authority, that is speaking to the PLO, Abu Mazen and whoever may succeed him, to obtain an agreement with them to end the conflict over the future of the West Bank is a very, very remote possibility. But in the circumstances, I would argue, if negotiating a deal with the Palestinian Authority is not possible, Israel should also have plan B. And plan B is rethinking control of the West Bank, gradually withdrawing from certain parts of it over a period of years with demilitarization enforced by Israel itself. Israel has to rethink the way in which it controls the West Bank. Israel must also rethink Arab Jerusalem. The Arab residents of Jerusalem are nearly 40% of the population of Jerusalem, but they are not citizens. And they have not been citizens for 54 years. And presently they are not the citizens of anywhere. That is not a situation that can continue forever. Israel must also rethink the Arabs in Israel, how they can be integrated as equals into the Israeli state while it maintains its character as the nation state 
of the Jewish people. Hanging on to its all. Hanging on to all of the West Bank and Gaza. Even though Israel is not in direct control of Gaza, of course, but still has a lot of influence on what happens there. Suppressing millions of people in the West Bank and out of Jerusalem. Fighting Gaza every few years and entering into a possible violent conflict with the Arab citizens of Israel, this is not a viable option. Abandoning the two-state idea, abandoning the idea of partition has very negative international ramifications for Israel's international legitimacy. The legitimacy of Israel from day one, even if we go back to the Balfour Declaration, but since the partition of 1947 and there and from then onwards, Israel's legitimacy in the eyes of the international community has always been linked to the idea of partition. The international community has never accepted the idea that all of historical Palestine belonged only to the Jews. So I would say we have come to a point now where we have just heard a wake up call. We cannot go on with the indecision as an alternative to a long-term strategy. After 1967, Israel decided not to decide, but that decision not to decide what we are supposed to do finally with the West Bank and Gaza, that decision not to decide after 1967 has proven to be awfully wrong. And normalization with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Morocco and Sudan are no alternative to a serious engagement with the Palestinians at all levels. Ignoring the Palestinian elephant in the room is a blindness that could cost Israel itself. It could cost us Israel if we don't wake up in time. Israel has been enormously successful in many ways and it has a great potential to remain so. But that requires courageous decisions by coming to terms with reality. The great achievement of Netanyahu's government of maintaining the status quo with the Palestinians and not giving up any territory at all is actually a huge step in the wrong direction, I would argue. We now have a new government in Israel, a very complicated uh, combination, Israeli style, a coalition of eight parties that are very different from one another, but it is a new government that may be a little bit more open-minded than its predecessor about rethinking Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, rethinking the place of uh, Arab Jerusalem, rethinking uh, the place of the Arab citizens in Israel. And as the time goes by, it becomes ever more urgent for Israel to think again how it places itself in this framework with our Palestinian neighbors. Thank you. And we can move on to Q&A whenever you are ready. Thanks again. Thank you, Asher. Uh, we have several questions coming in in all different forms, uh, different venues. Uh, let me start with this one. Recent polling conducted by Halil Shikaki uh, at the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah, I know a colleague of yours, uh, revealed that Palestinians now support Hamas and its confrontational approach to Israel over what they now see as the failed approach of Fatah, Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. How do Abbas and his faction challenge the narrative that Hamas is now the real representative of Palestinian interests? Well, I, you know, I, first of all, I know uh, Khalil Shikaki's work and I, I have a lot of respect uh, for what he does. Um, 
as I said in my talk, uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, canceled the elections for the Palestinian uh, Legislative Assembly precisely because he thought Hamas would win. Ed mentioned in the introduction uh, that I wrote a book uh, in 2010, which was called The Rise of Hamas in Palestine. Uh, so I, I think that uh, the, there is no surprise there. Uh, but one of the reasons why Hamas has benefited in recent years is because the Palestinian Authority hasn't achieved anything. And the lack of any achievement for those who believe in the political solution is what has discredited them and their political solution. So there is no question we have to uh, face Hamas and we have to deal with Hamas as uh, potentially the most powerful force uh, amongst the Palestinians. But uh, what Israel is now trying to do in the aftermath of the recent conflict is to revive direct contacts and uh, negotiations with the Palestinian Authority in order to give them more credibility in the eyes of their own population. If Israel doesn't talk to them, and if Israel ignores them, and all Israel does is contend with Hamas, obviously the Palestinians are going to see Hamas as the only player. And there's no reason why Israel should contribute to that by its own policy. Uh, so the idea is, and you will see, that now speaking about the reconstruction of Gaza, Israel wants to have Gaza reconstructed with the help of the international community and the Palestinian Authority, not through Hamas, not allowing Hamas to be uh, the sole mover and shaker uh, in Gaza as things are at present. So there still is a lot to do with uh, the more moderate uh, crowd within the Palestinian Authority. And by dealing with them and by giving the people a sense that the Palestinian Authority um, has a capability to make some movement on their behalf and to improve their situation by having a positive uh, political engagement with Israel will strengthen the Palestinian Authority, at least so the hope is with Israel. Uh, but uh, Khalil and his uh, poll is obviously correct. Hamas is on the rise in Palestine and has been for a long time. But uh, there are things that Israel can do about that, and it should, and sooner rather than later. Yeah, and if I remember that article well, the switch from 70% in favor of Fatah, 30 for Hamas, has switched radically in the last so many months. So yes. there's, there's an even more uh, a swifter pace to this change. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, from a former professor at Hebrew University. Our narrative is about the en endogamous people of Israel returning to their homeland after 2,000 years. The Romans acknowledged our ownership to Israel, as did the ancient Greeks and the Persians. The Holocaust as a genesis of modern Israel is part of their narrative, not ours. Could you indicate why it is that you ostensibly do not agree? Well, uh, I don't disagree, uh, but it's uh, if you uh, notice in Israel, come to Israel in the week before uh, your Matzmot. The week before your Matzmot starts with uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Then a week later, there is the, the Remembrance Day for the fallen soldiers, which breaks into your Matzmot the day after. The slogan, Misho Alet Kuma, is not my invention. Mishu Alet Kuma, that is from Holocaust to Redemption, is not an invention of mine. This is Israel's core narrative. Now, it's true that there is a historical justification that goes back thousands of years for the Jewish people and Eretz Israel. I uh, uh, fully appreciate that. Um, but um, there can be no doubt that the Zionist movement and the revival of the Zionist movement from Herzl onwards had to do with the predicament of the Jews in Europe. I refer you to David Vital, has a, a brilliant uh, series of volumes on the history of Zionism. Uh, and one can consult that, and David Vital was a great authority on the evolution of Zionism. Uh, so it's true that there are thousands of years of history, and it makes no sense for the redemption of the Jewish people to take place anywhere else except in Eretz Israel. That is obvious. But the, the revival of the Zionist movement is what has brought us to where we are. And that is a 19th century phenomenon, which was based on uh, the uh, suppression and the oppression of the Jews in Europe, which came to its 
uh, unfortunate uh, uh, zenith in the years of, uh, 90, of the 1940s of the Second World War. And I, I think Israel, the state of Israel and Israelis would be the last, uh, all you have to do is go to Yad Vashem uh, to see, uh, and other Israeli museums to see where the Holocaust fits into the Israeli political narrative. Well, <clears throat> I think this question is most appropriate for you, given, given that you're a recognized authority on Jordan. Thinking outside the box, with a high Palestinian population in Jordan, why hasn't there been a discussion of a Palestinian Jordanian confederation to solve the problem? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, in fact, it's uh, one of the core reasons for the poor relationship between Israel and Jordan. Uh, Jordan that made peace with Israel sees this idea as they call it the alternative homeland that is to turn Jordan because it has a Palestinian majority uh, which in self, itself is a question there, there, there is a Palestinian majority the question is how big it is and uh, nobody really knows um, but uh, the Jordanians find this argument um, as not, not just offensive, but hostile. Jordan is Israel's uh, close ally on the Eastern Front, on Israel's Eastern Front. It is uh, Israel's uh, buffer between uh, Israel and Iraq, between Israel and the East. Jordan is a critical component of Israel's security. The idea that Jordan should become something else and that the Jordanians should be sacrificed for the sake of the Palestinians is an idea that the Jordanians, needless to say, reject and fiercely. And as I say, the promotion of this idea and the Jordanians are fully aware of it and it's not an idea that is not discussed. This idea has been discussed for the last um, more than 40 years. A book was written about it in Jordan in 1981, which is 40 years ago. Um, so this is not new. And as far as the Jordanians are concerned, it is a hostile idea of people who seek Jordan's undoing. So it's uh, an idea that is around there and it's not that it hasn't been discussed. It has been discussed, uh, uh, as I say, for, for 40 years. And this was one of the reasons, if the fact that Israel does not proceed in the creation of a Palestinian state, which was the objective of the Jordanian peace with Israel, but that is what the Jordanians wanted to achieve. They wanted to achieve a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, so that this idea that Palestine is actually in Jordan would not be an issue. Palestine is Palestine and Jordan is Jordan. That's the Jordanian argument. And therefore making peace with Israel was in order to create a state in the West Bank and Gaza, so that it'd be clear to everyone that Palestine is in the West Bank and Gaza and not in Jordan. That was the whole logic of the Jordanian peace with Israel. So now people who say no Palestinian state, and in fact, we think the Palestinian state should be in Jordan, are discounting the entire logic of the Jordanians for making peace with Israel in the first place. That is an erosion of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, which we see today. And uh, I would say not in Israel's best interest uh, by any means. So uh, probably, one of the thorny, thorniest, if not the thorniest issue. How would you deal with the settlements in terms of rethinking how to deal with the West Bank? Uh, well, I, there, there are two, two types of, of settlements. Uh, there are uh, the settlement blocks, three major blocks of settlements. Uh, that include about 80% of the settlers. These three blocks of settlements were created after 1967, and they are all very close uh, to the old Israeli West Bank border. That is what is called the Green Line. If you take the three blocks of settlements, which have 80% of the settlers in them, and you annex them to Israel, you have to annex something like 
between eight and 10% of the West Bank. Uh, so I would say at the end of the day, these settlements in the blocks where 80% of the settlers are, somewhere around 8% of the West Bank should become part of Israel and should be annexed to Israel fully. Uh, when uh, this Palestinian state in the making uh, it begins to be created. Beyond these blocks, you have all these outposts. Uh, there must today be something like 150 of them. There are very many of them. They have small numbers of people in each one of them. Uh, they must altogether be somewhere around 100,000 people. Uh, who live in uh, over a hundred of these uh, outposts throughout the West Bank. And I think in the long run, eventually, uh, they will have to be removed uh, and become part, go back to becoming part of Israel. These people should either uh, emigrate into the settlement blocks that already exist or come back in, into Israel proper. But I don't think we can ever arrive at a settlement that uh, would be uh, somewhere uh, resembling a two-state reality. And I say a two-state reality, not a two-state solution, because uh, I don't think we're going to have a, a real solution in the full sense of the word. But creating a two-state reality uh, won't be possible if there are these hundred and something uh, illegal outposts uh, all over the West Bank. So those will eventually uh, have to be removed. I realize it's not easy, and removing 10,000 settlers from Gaza was very difficult. Removing 100,000 from the West Bank will be uh, obviously much more difficult. But if Israel wins, wishes to remain the nation state of the Jewish people, it cannot in, uh, tolerate a one state reality. In a one state reality, the Jews are going to become a minority. And according to certain numbers, they already are. There are figures out there that claim that the Palestinians are 6.8 million and the Jews 6.5. Uh, that may or may not be precise. Maybe it's a little different here and there, but basically the trend is obvious. Uh, and uh, therefore, if it is the nation state of the Jewish people that we wish to preserve, then uh, we're going to have to think about uh, withdrawing from territory, which as I said before, is the reason why Ariel Sharon withdrew from Gaza. Sharon didn't withdraw from Gaza because he thought Hamas would make peace with Israel. He knew they wouldn't. It wasn't about peacemaking. It was about keeping Israel Jewish. And I would argue the same about the settlements today. The changing the territorial arrangement of the West Bank is not necessarily about making peace. It's about keeping Israel Jewish. Because if Israel is not kept Jewish, what's the point? What's the point of the whole exercise? How about, uh, we're nearing the end of our time. Uh, could you address the foreign funding of Hamas and how this plays into the Israeli-Palestinian situation? Uh, well, uh, Hamas is uh, funded by uh, partly by Iran, as we know, and uh, uh, more so by uh, Qatar, which is uh, also in league with Iran on most issues. Um, Israel has actually uh, through the last decade or so, Israel has actually allowed this funding to go through. It went through with Israeli approval uh, in order to keep the peace. But what we have uh, found out, and it's not that we found it out now, Israel knew that all along, uh, Hamas wasn't using the money in order to uh, build schools and uh, hospitals and uh, social welfare centers, but uh, tunnels and rockets. Uh, so I think Israel has uh, an interest in allowing foreign funding to go in because uh, we don't want Gaza to uh, disintegrate and fall into our laps uh, ourselves. So Israel has an interest in foreign funding going in, but Israel has an interest uh, just as uh, importantly to control the funding that goes in to see and to supervise where it goes to. And that was never done effectively before. And what Israel is now trying to do in the reconstruction of the situation after the recent bout of fighting uh, 
is to arrange an international uh, supervision of the funding that goes into Gaza to try and make sure that this goes to where funding ought to go and not into tunnels and rocketry. We have, uh, we'll have maybe time for one more. Uh, here's one that comes up in a couple of different places. Um, given the, if I can paraphrase a couple of different ones, given the fractured nature of the uh, Israeli government now, uh, both the ruling coalition and the opposition are fractured. Um, will the political goals of the two sides override strategic national defense needs? Um, how will they work when you have uh, within the ruling coalition people from the, the far left and the far right? How will that work in deciding uh, policy? Uh, well, that, that's really a, a big question. One of the things that the people in this new government were saying was that since the government is made up of such disparate uh, factions, we will only deal with things that are in uh, consensus like uh, health and uh, infrastructure and the economy, we will avoid uh, issues uh, that are uh, in, uh, that we disagree over. Well, that's pie in the sky. Uh, the, the issues that we disagree over, can't wait for them to finish building Israeli hospitals. We're gonna have to deal with them now. Uh, so this, this government may not be able to function. But uh, on the other hand, they have very good reasons to try and stick together uh, and to um, manage their differences uh, in a way that allows them to, to, to stick together. Um, I don't think the Americans, for example, have any intention of coming down on Israel now in the short term on difficult matters that relate to the Palestinian question, uh, precisely because I don't think they want to push this government out. Um, secondly, Netanyahu, who is the only person who can bring this government down, Netanyahu doesn't have a majority. He needs a majority to bring this government down. Now, if he had a majority, he would have been the prime minister. The reason why Netanyahu is not the prime minister is because he doesn't have a majority. And he cannot bring this government down unless he does. So until Netanyahu has 61 votes in his own pocket, he can't bring this government down no matter what they do. So they may lose a vote here or there. They may not be able to pass a law here or there. But you cannot bring the government down unless you have what they call a constructive um, lack of confidence. You have to make a constructive vote of no confidence. That is, you cannot vote no confidence unless you've got your own 61. Unless you've got your own majority ready to take over, you cannot vote a government out of power. And Netanyahu doesn't have that 61. So uh, there still is a lot of, I think there is more leeway for this government to operate than people think at the moment. And I think the government may, may be able to last for longer than many people expect. I do not think, and I don't think that we will be called upon to make radical uh, changes in reference to the Palestinian issue um, in a one fell swoop. There's no deal of the century waiting out there. And the Trump example is yet another one uh, of, there's no deal of the century that uh, people haven't thought of. The reason why we don't have a deal is not because of some intellectual failing that the people in, engaged haven't got the right solution yet. There's no deal yet because there's no place for a deal. But the question is, what do you do in the meantime? And what Israel should do in the meantime is preserve the option of the two-state solution. Not make it, just preserve the option, but avoid doing what is designed to close down the two-state possibility. That is what Israel should do. And this government, maybe with a little help from the US administration would be able to do that. And at present, I would argue that would be progress. And the question is about creating hope on the other side that there is a possibility of change. 
doesn't mean that we have to withdraw tomorrow morning. But what it does mean is showing that there is a goodwill and to look for a way out of where we are um, and to realize um, that maintaining the status quo is not necessarily in Israel's own best interests. In fact, I would argue without any hesitation that it is not in Israel's best interests. If the chief objective is to maintain Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. If that is the objective, then there are things that we have to do. Maybe small measures uh, spread out over a long period of time, but avoiding from doing what we know is designed to make two states impossible. Thank you, Usher, for a great presentation and thoughtful response to all of these questions. Many more are in there that we, we just won't have time to get to. Uh, in the meantime, uh, while we wait for the, the big solutions, uh, as you noted, uh, what do we do in the meantime? What we will do in the meantime is continue to listen to you and others like you uh, in giving us insight, critical insight into the vexing issues and insight into what might be some of the solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all you've done through the years for the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies and the University of Arizona. Uh, we're very proud and honored to call you one of us, one of our friends. Thank you, Asher, very much. Thank you all for joining us and keep tuned to our website and our emails for our next lecture uh, in July. Uh, the date has yet to be determined, but we'll have some more upcoming lectures.